The reading is from 1 John chapter 2. If you're using one of the church Bibles, you can find this on page 1226. And I'm beginning to read at verse 18. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, even eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And as we come before it this evening to hear it proclaimed, Lord, give us humble hearts before your word, to look at the pages of Scripture and to see what you have to say to us, and to have lives then that are in obedience to your truth for our good and for the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please do be seated and do turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2 as we continue our series in this wonderful letter, and we're looking at verses 18 to 27 this evening, and also uh, there's a sermon uh, handout that you've been given in the way in that you may um, find um, useful to have in front of you. Now, it's during World War II that um, Neville um, Chamberlain, he um, tried to keep the peace by appeasing Adolf Hitler, and after giving him Poland, he then returned to Britain, um, proclaiming peace in our times, and of course, at that point, Winston Churchill wisely observed and said this, an appeaser is someone who feeds a crocodile hoping it will eat him last. Okay, that was his um, words. Now, throughout the history of the church, there have been those who would seek to appease false teachers. And then they readily start devouring the truth until there's none of it left. In verses 15 to 17, John gave this warning that you could be drawn away by the world. And now he focuses in on what's at his heart of the letter, these false teachers who are coming with weird and warped views of Christ and seeking to draw people after and themselves away from Christ. But John will not appease false teachers. He won't have anything of it. He knows the outcome of it. He knows the consequences and the great danger that there is. And so he writes to warn these early Christians and us too about those who would seek to lead us astray. There are always those who would seek to lead the people of God astray. And for John, forewarned is forearmed. That's verses 18 to 19. John says it's the last hour. The last hour hour or the last days as it's sometimes referred to in the Bible is that time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming, or probably more specifically between Pentecost, the giving of the Spirit to the church, and Christ's second coming. 
But a question that you should ask, and I wonder if you've asked yourself this, the last hour of what? He says it's the last hour, but the last hour of what? Well, it's the last hour of this present evil age, this world that stands in opposition to God. Think about it like the phrase, if you use it, when you talk about something being on its last legs. Do you use that phrase? You mean something is close to death, something's in its final stages. You're not going to get much longer out of the camera. It's on its last legs, its last hour. And how do we know that we live in the last hour? Because God has sent his son into the world. Because God has sent the Messiah, the Christ, the promised rescuer, king. He has come into the world. And the Old Testament prophets said that with the coming of the Christ, it would be the end of man's days and the start of his kingdom and a new age that he would bring in. And thus he brings an end and brings a finality to this last hour, this present evil age. Uh, Putting it this way, this present evil age is on its last legs. It's on its way out, and Jesus has sought that out. See, the very fact, verse 18, that there are antichrists, did you notice that? Verse 18, much talk about antichrists, means that we're in the last hour, the last days. Here's the logic. John says that there are antichrists. Now, if there are antichrists, it presupposes that we've already had the Christ. Do you get that? In order to have an antichrist, you've got to have the Christ. And John says that when the Christ comes, he will bring an end to this present evil age and therefore usher in the last hour. Okay? Think about antisocial behavior. You can't have antisocial behavior until you've first established that there is a social behavior, there's a social norm, an acceptable way to behave, and then you can have antisocial behavior. So the logic is, John says, we're in the last hours. We know this because there are many antichrists. And if there are many antichrists, then the Christ must have come. And if the Christ has come, then we're definitely in the last hours because that's what follows his days. The end of man's days is followed by Christ's days. Yes? We're in the last hour. Uh, Someone once told me, someone who lived in Africa, that the most dangerous creature uh, in the jungle Um, was a wounded and cornered lion. He said a wounded and a cornered lion would lash out ferociously at at anyone um, nearby. And the devil, that lion who prowls around in the last hour, is ferociously lashing out, seeking to devour the truth, seeking to attack Christ's people through many antichrists who would water down the message and deviate from what has been taught. Think about it like this. One of the great proofs that Jesus is the Christ is the Antichrist spirit that operates in the world, the Antichrist spirit that has gripped the world. Think about Jesus. He is the most loved person in human history and the most hated. The most loved and the most hated. And that dominant attitude of the world that is against Christ, that seeks to replace Christ or displace Christ, is actually proof that he is the Messiah. Do you see what I'm saying? If he wasn't the true Messiah, there wouldn't be such an antichrist spirit in operation. It wouldn't have to rise because it would have nothing to battle against. It's proof that we live in the last hour Because that wounded, cornered devil is throwing everything he can in one final ferocious attack on Christ by attacking his people through attacking the truth. John wants us to know that we're in the last hours because forewarned is forearmed. He says, if you know the days you're living in, you'll know how to live in those days. And we live in the last hour when the devil is seeking to bring down the truth. Did you notice that John was certain that um, there was this antichrist um, figure that would come? Uh, but he also says, as well as this antichrist figure that will come, there are many antichrists even now uh, in his day that have appeared. But what does he mean? What does he mean by this phrase? Many antichrists have appeared. 
Well, it means that that spirit of opposition that would characterize the Antichrist is already in operation in these many Antichrists, these many false teachers who went out from the church but showed that they didn't belong to the church by preaching what was against the truth. The prefix anti um, can mean one of two things. It can mean instead of, so instead of Christ, or it can mean in opposition to um, Christ. So these false teachers that rose up within um, the church, they presented a system that was subtly different um, to what these people had already heard. Something instead of Christ, just enough changes to lure people after themselves. And then those gullible people who took that bait were led farther away from Christ until they were in opposition to Christ. Do you get that? You needn't choose between instead of or against or in opposition because someone presents something that is subtly different to Christ and so you can have him instead of Christ and then you follow it and you end up in opposition to Christ. That's the Antichrist teaching. And the spirit of the Antichrist is in operation during the last hour. But don't think about uh, when I say the spirit of the Antichrist, don't think about um, this being or many beings that somehow go and possess certain individuals and get them to teach certain things. Think a bit more about when we use the phrase, the spirit of the age. You know, the spirit of the, you say the spirit of the age, it means that dominant uh, worldview, that dominant system that um, dictates people's values and what they hold in high regard, the spirit of the age. And the spirit of this age, this last hour, is an anti-Christ spirit that is against Jesus. Forewarned is forearmed. That's what John wants for us. He says, if we know that the anti-Christ spirit is in the world, if we know how the anti-Christ spirit operates, then we can better arm ourselves in our struggle and battle against the spirit of the age. So how do we spot Antichrist um, teaching? Well, the first thing, verse 19, to avoid getting caught off guard, we need to look in the right place. Those who embody um, the spirit of the Antichrist use Christian language. They usually begin within the church, as John said. They went out from us. First teaching, their teaching was sound, it was healthy, sounded and biblical. Then come the subtle changes that shape their ministry and start to shape and mold Christ into something that he's not, and into a gospel that is not the gospel. Their teaching is no longer sound, it's corrupt, it's no longer healthy, it's diseased. We need to look in the right place. If we're always thinking that Antichrist, um, sort of the spirit of the Antichrist will be most manifest outside the church, then we'll miss it. Because the Antichrist spirit is going to be most manifest within the church. They rise up from within. They went out from us, but they showed that they did not belong to us because they did not remain with us. We need to look in the right place, and we need to name and expose those who give themselves the name Christian but their teaching is anything but Christian. And the second thing, to avoid getting led astray, is we need to look at the right person, verse 22. They always attack Christ. Okay, it's simple, isn't it? They always attack Christ. Anyone who teaches a deviant view of Christ as to who he is, where he came from, what he came to do, is an antichrist. You see, if the Christ they speak of is not the Christ of the Bible, it's not the Christ that has been worshipped in the churches and at life, then they're operating under the spirit of the antichrist. And what does it always say? They deny. It, they, they look at Jesus and they deny. They deny things about Christ, denied what has been revealed and spoken about him. So while they may be very nice people... Uh, the Jervis Witnesses, uh, the Mormons, often very nice when they come to your door, kind, polite people, but their message is of the spirit of the Antichrist, for they deny who Christ is. 
according to his eternal being, according to his human nature, according to his work upon the cross. John Calvin said that Christ is the sum of the gospel, and so heretics will always aim their arrows squarely at Christ because he is the sum of the gospel. So we look in the right place, they arise from within. We look at the right person, they will always be attacking Christ, something about him. But also, thirdly, we need to look at every person. You see, although this attitude, this spirit of the Antichrist, although it's personified in one person, the Antichrist that John said would come, And in John's day, we're seeing in many persons, these false teachers who went out from the church. It is displayed in any person who is against Christ, the the unbeliever. You see, anyone who attacks Christ or assaults Christ, denies or distorts Christ, seeks to chip away or change Christ, is of the Antichrist spirit. So in some respects, all believers, uh, unbelievers to some measure possess this spirit of the Antichrist because they seek to replace or displace um, Christ. So yet there will be one person, an Antichrist, who personifies this spirit. There are many Antichrists in John's day, and there will be in our days, who publicly speak against Christ and deny him and distort him. But in some respect, all unbelievers have the spirit of the Antichrist because they replace Christ, have things instead of him, and they're against him in opposition to him. See, John is the master of contrast, isn't he? He's already contrasted light and darkness in chapter 1. He's already contrasted love and hate in chapter 2. He's contrasted um, the family uh, of God with the world in verses 15 to 17. And now he contrasts the struggle between truth and error in regards to Christ. John says that forewarned is forearmed. See, we need to know the days uh, that we're living in. And being forewarned is fundamental to faithful living. This is verses 20 um, to 27. If you know your enemy, then you're equipped to fight against um, the enemy. So John says we need to stand by um, the truth. Look at verse 23. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father. And then he goes on in verse 25 to say, and that all this concerns God's promise of eternal life. You see, if we're not wearing the bulletproof vest of sound doctrine, sound teaching, then the enemy's shots can hit a vital organ and result in the loss of of our life. Do you see how important it is to stand by the truth? If you deny the truth about God's Son, then you do not have the Father. And if you do not have the Father, then you do not have eternal life. We need to stand by the truth. When I was younger, and my mum used to take me off to the dentist, we got these stickers. It was very popular at the time. And it used to say, brush daily, avoid tooth decay. Okay? Brush daily and avoid tooth decay. And then in Sunday school, in that same period, I got a sticker to put on my Bible that said, read daily, avoid truth decay. Okay? I remember at the time, I'd go to the dentist and I'd go to think, but haven't they got it right? (laughs) Wasn't that spot on as a young child? What a wonderful message. Stand by the truth. Avoid truth decay. Now at this point, people may be thinking, well, you're placing a very heavy emphasis on truth here. You seem to be drawing a lot of truth lines in the sand and saying, well, you're either on one side of that truth line or you're on the other side of the truth line. And that doesn't fit with my modern um, sort of sensibilities. That's not the modern way of thinking to have such rigid um, lines. But notice what John says. Notice his statement in verse 20. He says, you all know the truth. And then verse 21 I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. John, who writes this wonderful letter of love, he is a truth line drawer. And he said, I'm drawing it now, fast in the ground for all to see. 
And I'm saying to you guys, you're on the right side of that truth line. And I don't want you to pass over it because of these whispers of the false teachers that have a subtle new message to lure you away. Just a new bit of teaching about Christ. And John says, no, there's a truth line. And you guys who I'm writing to are on the right side of it. And you mustn't cross over as you hear their silky smooth voices saying, we just got a little bit more for you to know. So we need to stand by the truth. But verse 24, we need to settle with the truth. He goes on to talk about remaining in the Son and the Father, remaining or um, abiding. Uh, It's John's word, uh, remaining, abiding, uh, for uh, a close fellowship, a close relationship um, with um, God. He uses it six times in these um, few um, verses. It's that word abide, it's kind of like to take up permanent uh, residence or to have a settled um, home. Uh, When I um, go um, traveling places, I always take my sat nav now, I can't read a map. Um, You put in the postcode, you choose your destination, and it takes you there, doesn't it? But even with this sat nav, I don't know if you like me, because I'm always looking for these bears on the left. It's always telling me to bear left, and I'm always scared of those bears. So I, I'm going down, and even when it says you know, in, uh, right in 100 yards, and then there's two rights really close to each other, and which one is it? Or at the traffic light, which lane are you supposed to be in? Because it says there's only two, and it's telling you to uh, get in the left-hand um, lane, or the, get in the, sorry, the middle lane, and there's only two lanes. And you think, well, which one am I supposed to be in? Okay, but when you're coming back from anywhere you've been to, there's got that wonderful button that just says home, doesn't it? You press home. And when I get into the A63, I can turn off my sat nav. Why? Because I know every turn. I know every road. I know all the lanes, and I know which one I need to be in, and I know which one I need to be in to avoid sort of the grumpy taxi drivers. You know everything about it because I'm going home. And I finally get home, and I know which chair I'm going to sit in, and I know when I'm going to put my red bush tea because I'm <laughs> home. Yeah? And John says, let God's word be at home. We walk closely with Jesus when his truth by the power of the Spirit is at home in our hearts. See, we're to remain. Look, here's how John puts it. Verse 20. You have an anointing from the Holy One. And then in verse 27 the anointing you received from him remains in you. What will it mean for the Holy Spirit um, to be at home in our lives, to abide with us? Well, When Jesus takes up residence in your heart um, through his Holy Spirit and by his truth, then that's what it means to abide. That's when the language of home really connects with us. You see, for most people, and when you move into a new um, home, you start to make it your own. You um, begin by clearing out the rubbish left by the previous residents, maybe. The op- operation clean up the filth and grime from years of neglect um, starts. But room by room, you go around, you maybe decorate, and you um, put furniture in, you put up the curtains, hang some pictures and paintings, putting your mark um, on um, the place. It's a process that takes time and effort and financial input as you turn this house uh, into a home. Uh, Legally, it's been yours since the exchange of contracts and completion. But now this house that is legally yours, you want to be your home. You want it to be where you belong and uh, are settled. And John says, God has made us his home. He has purchased us through the sacrifice of his son. He has set us apart by the power of the Holy Spirit. The contract has been signed. We are legally his. And now the Spirit lives within us. And he is cleaning cleaning out the, the rubbish and the grime from years of neglect. He's going around room by room, starting to put Christ's mark on us as he decorates with all the colors of the character of Christ, clearing out and putting Christ's mark on the place. He's making this house that is legally his, his home, where he abides, where he dwells. And this process takes time, and it takes effort, and it takes um, significant input on God's part. 
You see, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Therefore, God's truth starts to feel comfortable in us. You see, this language of home is wonderful. You feel most comfortable and relaxed and settled at home. And God's truth is to remain in us, abide in us. It's got to be at home. Of course, there'll be, there'll be squabbles. You move in and you move into a new home and your wife crazily thinks that the, the, the reclining chair would be better in this place, which is nowhere near the TV. And you think the reclining chair would be better right in front of the TV and you have disagreements. And of course, the Spirit comes and He's waging war against our sinful nature and there'll be battles to be had. But in the end, because we have God's people, it means that God's truth through the Spirit of Christ wins out in the end. And he starts reordering this house to be God's home, where his truth is comfortable and settles. It's an amazing thing when the truth settles in our lives. So we're to stay um, by the, stand by the truth, settle with the truth, and we're to stay with the truth, verses 26 and 27. There's always been those who would seek to um, lead us astray, modern twists on the gospel that have very little to do with Jesus of Nazareth. But if you're going to stay with the truth, I'll give you two things um, this evening um, that I think you need to do. First, never grow tired of the gospel. That's what it means to stay with the truth, never growing tired of the gospel. Don't think that you don't need to hear it, that you don't need to meditate on it, and over and over again, when you hear those um, old truths time and time again, accept them, refresh yourself with them, bring your life into conformity uh, with them. I asked, I did some training for the ladies, one-to-one uh, -one ladies, and I said, do you ever get bored during service? Do you ever get bored of hearing the same thing over and over again? And we all put our hands up because it's true that we do, but we mustn't. We mustn't bore of the gospel we must never grow tired of hearing the gospel. See, we should know it so well that we can spot in an instant any deviation from it because I'm pouring over the word and it gives me this accurate picture of Christ and someone comes along and pre presents something else and I go, no. <laughs> that is not what has been revealed to us. You can spot a deviation at a moment. It was said of John um, Bunyan, who um, the author of Pilgrim's um, Progress, that his blood was bibline. <laughs> that if you cut him, the Bible would flow out of him. What a wonderful description. You know, I want people to say that of me. Do you want people to say that of you? That your blood is bibline. <laughs> that if you just cut, it flows out. Because then we will spot any deviation. We're never growing tired of the gospel. But secondly, never moving on from Revelation. If we're going to stay with the truth, never moving on from Revelation. I want to pick up on verse 27 that can appear um, confusing. Just have a look at it. Like always, you must interpret um, verse 27 within its context and within the light of the entire New Testament. Now, John is not saying that the church does not need godly teachers to instruct um, the flock. Imagine if he was saying that. He says, doesn't he, you do not need anyone to teach you. Well, what are you trying to do, John? <laughs> if, he meant, if he meant that literally, he would invalidate his own letter because it's a letter of entire teaching. So what does he actually mean when he says you do not need anyone to teach you? Well, what he means is he's going back to these false teachers. These false teachers are saying, ah, well, we know that you've received some teaching, but if you just come over this way and cross over this line, we've got something else. Boy, have we got something else for you. And John says, no, absolutely not. Don't go there. He says, every Christian has the indwelling Holy Spirit, enabling them to understand, confirming the truth of Christ in their lives. When they heard about Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully man, who lived the perfect life, who gave um, his life as the perfect um, substitutionary sacrifice for sin. The Holy Spirit confirmed these truths within them as what they really are, the truth, not counterfeit. He says, so don't listen to these people who say, it's got a little bit more for you. He says, no, you've got exactly what you need in the spirit of truth. 
You see, the gospel is not a secret truth held by a few elite believers. It's revealed truth for every believer. So let me conclude, and I'm going to conclude with a a section from a, watch my hand, Christian book, okay? And I'm going to interject at points, because I think it drives the point home for us. This is what he says. God is intimately personal with us and speaks in ways that are peculiar to our own hearts. Okay, tick. I suppose as I speak this evening, God will be speaking specifically to different hearts, taking some of the truth and confirming it in different ways in your lives. And he goes on, peculiar to our own hearts, not just through the Bible, question mark, but through the whole of creation. Okay, I got my rubber out, and I rubbed out the press question mark. The Bible talks about specific revelation through the Scriptures, and general revelation, and that we can know things about God from creation. Okay. To Stasi, he speaks through movies. To Craig, he speaks through rock and roll. God's Word comes to me in many ways, through sunsets and friends and films and music and wilderness and books. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay? It doesn't. If you enjoyed that last paragraph, okay, and you want to talk more about it afterwards, come and see me. It doesn't. These things may remind us, cause us to reflect on something that God has revealed in the Scriptures, The Spirit may even use them to prompt us to think once again about something that we've heard in the Scriptures, but they are not God's Word to us. Okay? That is the teacher that just says, I've got a little bit more for you. And you can only get it in our elite way. No. No. See, forewarned is forearmed. We're in the last hours and the Antichrist Christ spirit is prevalent all around us. And forearmed is fundamental to Christian living. We have the Holy Spirit abiding, abiding within us so that we can remain in God's truth and God's truth can remain in us. We have all that we need. So remember, to appease false teaching is to be one of those who feeds a crocodile hoping that it will devour you last. Let's pray. Father, you have been unbelievably kind to us in giving us your word and spirit. What more could we ask for, Lord? And yet we confess at times we do ask for more in our folly. Lord, help us to appreciate the gift you have given us in your spirit who abides within us and your truth that he caused to be inspired that each one of us as believers can know the Son and know the Father and thus have eternal life. Amen.